the meeting of the Charter Review Commission, March 10th, 2014. I am going to call the roll. Twyla Jones. Here. Dave Albright. Here. Doug Detweiler. Russell Sipen. Here. Dean Martin. Here. Drew Romito. Here. Jenny Spira. Here. Jay Magnus. Here. And Kimberly Monachino. Here. All right. We have a almost full house. We do not have any approval of minutes, as Shannon apologized for not being able to get the ones from the last meeting submitted. Were you guys able to approve the other amended minutes that and the meetings from the meeting prior to the last meeting? Yes. yes. All right. We will get into audience participation now. If you are going to participate, I ask that you go to the podium. Anything at this point in time? There will be an opportunity for audience comments afterwards. All right, we're going to get to old business. So if somebody fill me in on what happened at the last meeting and where we are right now, please. At the last meeting, we finished reading the entire charter. We just went all the way through. And what we decided was at this meeting, we just sort of recap all the areas of the charter we want to be considering through the commission to look at for suggested changing. And that changes. That's what I've, I've tried to do a recap here. Jenny, is this yes. what you did? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I went through the minutes. I went through my notes on the, that I was making in the charter. Um, I incorporated some of the suggestions we had from some of the audience participation. Those are on the back, you know, with miscellaneous and sort of just tried to recap. So hopefully I got it all. I might not have, but hopefully if we review this, if I missed anything, people can insert it. So what does everyone suggest? Would you like to run down the uh, the bullet points or would that be, would we bring that up at a different portion of the meeting? What do you guys want to do here? I guess under new business, right? We'll just go through it. Okay. Point by point. Sounds good. To also, me. we got a uh, an amended charter. I don't know if you got that, Russ. We got it from uh, David Maestro at the last meeting. I think Harry's got one for us. Yep. The one I was reading, though, does have. There was a couple of things that were incorrect in there, and they were highlighted. Ah, gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, let's start with our bullet points. Uh, Section 3.07, meetings of council currently states shall, shall hold regular meetings on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. Mr. Romito thinks meeting day should be left at the discretion of council and mayor to be determined at first meeting in December. Mrs. Gadosh stated that council made decision on meeting days in 1990 and it was amended in 2001. Mr. Ceresi commented regarding timing of the summer break for council, requested that the timing be changed to the entire month of July instead of the last half of July and the first half of August. So let's address that last bullet point first because I think it's the easiest one. Mm -hmm. So Gary, you were asking, I believe that the wording was going to be something to the effect that the last meeting of the year would be the, the last council meeting of June, correct? Yes. And that it would reconvene at the first scheduled meeting in September. In August. August, okay. If, if you look at the charter itself, if, if you just looked at changing after the second meeting in June and then until the first scheduled meeting in August. Gary, okay. just out of curiosity on, on that issue as to what we're doing here on this Charter Review Commission versus what would that be something that uh, as we look at the uh, methods and procedures, the amendments to the charter, would that be something that the council could or should it be could do. more empowered to do that because it's a your meetings kind of thing as opposed to us sending something to you to review, to vote on anyway, if that makes any sense? It could be. 
is it something the council wants to do? It, it, we're bringing it up, but council hasn't brought it up, I guess is my point. Well, that's why I'm here. Okay. And I did bring it up to council, and the response I got was, I don't have a problem with it. That's okay. That's okay. That's you don't have a they, the council doesn't have a problem with the way it is or making a change. It. Okay. And it doesn't. In the end, it doesn't really matter because council can change the days of right. meeting anyway if they really wanted to. And the last eight years that I've been here, we've had three or four years that we met anyway during that time because we had emergencies and things going on. So uh, there can be changes to that. Sure. This just came to me from someone, and I said I would bring it forward. Sure. I'd like to comment on that. Uh, I spoke to the city engineer about that, and she says there is never a time that she doesn't go into July for legislation, and even then needs special legislation, just the way her workload and her bid process. So she was concerned that if we change it and make it specific, that if she needs a special meeting, as has happened in the past, not recently, but we weren't able to get uh, a special meeting during the summer for lack of quorum. And she thinks that could be a real detriment, at least from her department. So she would like to at least speak on that if, if you're going to make a decision. Yeah, she's to more put than welcome. Charter. I, I mean, my, my gut would just tell me, hearing that, that since nobody seems to be jumping for joy or stomping their feet, that they want to get this changed, uh, although it was brought up by somebody, uh, I mean, that's a legitimate problem, I, w I would imagine. It affects the operations of the department uh, for sure, and, and it then can affect the entire city if she can't get a project, a change order processed, or uh, a bid approved. So she, she had definite concerns. Okay. All right. Were there any other concerns that were voiced to anyone? Okay, let's go back to the top of 3.07 now and get a dialogue going on this. Uh, What's it, what is everyone's feelings? And Gary, I'm going to go to you, and Mayor, I'll go to you too about the the ability to change or set the date at the beginning of each year on when council meetings are actually held. I think the most important thing is that they're fairly consistent. It's people get used to coming to meetings at a certain time, a certain day, um, regardless of. And, and as I said a moment ago, we could change them like we do usually in December to avoid being in a holiday season. Um, and we've done that several times. I mean, we do that every year in December, but we, you know, we have the, we can, we can change them if we need to. Yeah, I, does anybody else have any uh, opinions do. or input? I do, because I brought this up. So I, I was looking at the other um, uh, charters from the cities, for instance, and, and I haven't seen any of that locked in. I mean, if somebody has one, they can bring it forward. I haven't seen a charter, and I'm not saying it's wrong because everyone does it differently, in that, or we're wrong because we do it differently than everybody else, but I, um, I, I think it just makes more logic to let council decide when they want to have those meetings. So Stowe says regular meetings at 8 p.m. on the first regular working day of January of each year, council shall convene and organize at the council chambers of the municip municipality, the mayor or uh, one appointed by the mayor shall preside uh, as temporary chairperson until the president of council elected. Thereafter, council shall meet at times as may be prescribed by its rules or regulations, bylaws, or by resolution or ordinance, except that it shall hold regular meetings at least once during each calendar month. Now, um, Solon is, is real similar. It says uh, at least once each calendar month, and they don't lock in a date. Bless you, Mayor. Um, let's see. So, I mean, that's why I brought it up in the first place. Uh, I just, I don't think they should be locked in um, to, a, to, to two days in a month. Maybe Mondays are better. I know some of the communities do it on Monday, and, uh, you know, I, I, like I brought this up in the beginning, I think a lot of times if people are traveling and they really want to get to a council meeting, they're more likely to be home on a Monday than a Tuesday or a Wednesday or a Thursday. You know, they might be able to, re if they really have an issue they want to talk about in front of council, maybe they can take that Monday, but then they got to get on the road. Right. But on a Tuesday, it's tough. So Solon says the council shall ho hold at least one uh, regular meeting at each calendar month. The majority of the members of council shall constitute quorum. Um, and then it says, 
all meetings of the council shall be open to the public and its journal shall be available for public inspection. It said council shall by ordinance make provisions for the time and place of regular meetings of the council, the method of calling special meetings of council. So again, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't lock council members into certain, certain days. So I just thought it'd be a little bit more flexibility if we, if we changed it. It does give you flexibility. Um, I do know that m I don't think anybody would opt for Mondays just because of the fact that you have so many federal holidays that are on Mondays, so you're missing mm -hmm. meetings. That's not to say that something couldn't be rescheduled uh, in lieu of a, a holiday. But I know from wh where Gary's coming from, the consistency, uh, y you know, and sometimes the way it's always been done is okay. Uh, consistency could come into play here. And I just see the, I think the potential, maybe not with this council and mayor, but at some point in time, I mean, if you have a council that can't agree on anything, you may have, you know, a fight going on just as to when they're going to meet each each year. My opinion would be that that keeping things status quo, in this sense, would uh, would make a little sense. Does anybody else have any input on this? Yeah, I, my opinion, I think, on this is it does not seem to be a problem with either the council members or the mayor as they're not bringing, they didn't bring up this subject of changing the meeting dates. And ac according to what um, Mrs. Skados said, it was council who made the decision on meeting days back in 1990, uh, which was amended in 2001. And it's, so it's evidently been working for the last 13 years. So I'm thinking we have more important things to discuss that maybe this isn't since it doesn't seem to be coming from council or the mayor that this might not be something we need to address with some of the more urgent issues. That so we when we get to, to, to these points where one group may have an opinion and the other one may have another opinion, how do you guys want to proceed with even making the determination if we go further and explore it or if we just say, no, this is it? Do we want to put it to a vote just to see if we want to or do we? I don't know that we need to put it to a vote. I mean. So we just, do we just I tell mean, Drew, we oh, well, whatever, no, it's we not. Just, <laughs> well, no, we I think, I think this is a democracy, so I think a vote might be a good idea. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, think certainly, certainly I, mean, I, I mean, I don't know if we're at the point yet of You know, of and you bring up I a mean, very good point there. I, I, I think what we're, we're at the point of starting to discuss these things and looking at them. And then when we meet at the end of the month, after we've had some time to go and research each of these things, maybe compare to other charters and you know, look a little more deeply at them, at that time we can come together and maybe every person, I mean, there's not really that many things that we're going to be looking at that each person can address their opinion and then we can take a vote on whether or not we want to pursue this because then if we do, we, then we have to you know, have the public hearings, we have to publish the proposed changes, I believe. Um, so at, at the next meeting, oh. I think, is where we should be voting on which items we are going to, the commission, excuse me, will decide which items we do think are in need of amending and which ones we're going to pursue. Jenny, you had me at I think. <laughs> and so, no, I agree with you completely there. So move on to section uh, 4.01. So how are we going to go about these? We're just going to discuss them? Now? Well, I think we're discussing them today. And let's say at the, the, the meeting at the end of the month, we at least vote amongst council, uh, the commission, as to which ones we really want to continue going further with is yeah, my discussion thought, today. I mean, right? We're we're more. We just bring if people want to bring their ideas, just share them with the commission so that we can all give consideration while we're doing our research. And at then when at the next meeting, we'll be ready to 
discuss each one of these points in depth. So this is more or less just like a recap meeting to say this is what we looked at. Here's some thoughts on it. Okay. You know, I, how do you, you think feel? Through, I mean, that yeah. Clarify. Did you no, ask? I don't me? Yeah, I was just wondering how we're going to go on it. Okay. I don't know how much what everyone else wants to do. I I have no problem proceeding that way and and having this to be the open discussion and on the 31st, which I believe is when the, the next meeting is to, to really at least make a decision which ones we're going to consi proceed, consider. Yes? Yes? Yeah, it makes yeah. more yes. sense. Yeah. Yeah. All right, section 4.01 on the election of the mayor. We did have a note in there that we needed more discussion on the requirement for a primary. Uh, okay, this is something we talked about last week, Russ, when, okay. uh, when you weren't here. But the mayor brought up a good point. We, d we were discussing the primary. One of the things that I discussed, you know, I brought up was we had some discussion about that. You know, if you have a primary in May and someone gets 60 some percent of the vote and three or four people run, do you really need another, do you really need to have another election? And somebody, you know, some people brought up really good points about maybe the turnout will be lighter in a primary. But then it was brought up that, you know, the one of the things about the primary is it's in May and then you have the general election in November. So if the incumbent would lose in May, you'd have what, seven months um, virtually that you would have a lame dunk, lame duck uh, mayor. So you know, maybe that's something we want to research if other communities do it and you know, have a September primary or a different date. I think with the September primary too, several cities have it that if somebody wins by over 50% of the vote, then they don't have to go to the mm -hmm. general because it's only a month or a month and a half away or something mm -hmm. where everybody's kind of in that. But, so you might want to check that too. I was an alternate on this charter review that, that placed this on the ballot and quite personally, my whole opinion was at the time was that this was put on purely for political reasons. Uh, I was absolutely against the primary. Uh, I, I heard the argument made that, well, this guarantees that somebody at least wins by 50% and my answer was, so what? I, I don't think it's that big of a deal if you have a, you know, 35 percent, 30, whatever the balance is. Then it's the winner wins at an election. Uh, does anybody else have an opinion? Because mine is, I, I think you bring up a good point. You know, I, I think you either have it or you don't. Um, I think if you have somebody that a uh, mayor that wins by more than 50 percent, I guess you could kind of sit there and say that that's a, a shoe in moving forward, but then my question would be what, what happens between, if something happens between mm -hmm. that primary and the final election where it may be a factor that makes people say, well, wait a minute now. Uh, does That's anybody why I don't like that May election. I do agree with that. Ah, yeah. mm. I think a, a much closer in primary makes sense like September or something. I believe it's Stowe and Solon have September primary. My only concern, Russ, is if we have, if you have that early primary and you have someone that takes 50 plus percent of the vote and you've got a couple other people that split the percent, the rest of the percentages, you may not necessarily have wanted to vote for that person who won 50 plus percent and the other candidates may have split mm -hmm. people who know them and so forth and you know, you may have a couple of people you really like but you can obviously can only vote for one. So when you get down to the two, that's why I think, um, I think it's good to have the primary, but don't make that uh, obviously that that person is going to be winner for the office um, if they happen to be in more than 50 percent of the vote. Because I may vote for one person in the primary, and when it comes down to the, m the final election or the main election, go, boy, I really didn't. I know that person won more than 50 percent, but I like the other person a little bit more, and you know, you shift your vote, so to speak. Right. Um. <coughs> well, I, I, I do not believe that we would have a chance, even if it made it to the ballot, I don't believe that anybody would vote for doing away with the primary because I, I think that somebody would look at like you're, you're taking away Take a right. Away a vote. Mm -hmm. sure. mm -hmm. It's already been given. That's why once this is done, it's done. Mayor, I don't know, is, th is there any opportunity to, ch you can't, I mean, you have an automatic almost general election in May. Um, you don't want to get to a point where you have to start calling a special election and 
some other month to make that window shorter? I mean, does well, I, that's why I'm, I'm saying I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Stowe. I'm 99% sure it's Stowe that's September. Of course, so will be Cuyahoga County anyway. Um, I, I just don't even like the idea that if the incumbent doesn't get enough votes and they're not going on to the general election, that's a long time to have somebody in office that has, you know, really maybe no motivation for some people to continue on with that position. I, I just don't like that whole feel to it. Right. I think that's not good. So you feel if it's closer towards I think if you're going to have a primary, it should be closer, and I really do. Okay. Russ, I, I do think I, I agree with that. That is a huge space mm -hmm. between Enormous. the two elections. Yep. I also don't like the idea of eliminating the primary because I've worked for a decade as a poll worker, and the turnout at a primary is so much less than what you get at your regular election that a lot of people will come out and vote. They let the people vote in the primary who are the diehard people who really know what they want to vote on. And then you get the more general public out at your regular November um, election. And yeah, which, which, which has always been a reason for me to think, is it really a fair election? You know, it's the same mm -hmm. way the schools always say they get criticized for having an off-month election. Um, I don't know, I have several reasons that I either don't like it or at least have it in closer to the election yeah, process. I, I agree, that is a very long time, especially if the incumbent wouldn't make Six it. Six months to mm -hmm. sit there. Yes. And we even talked about taking away, f uh, you know, distracting the incumbent from their duties running such a long election season, it, almost an entire year, getting ready for a May primary. Can be can be kind of grueling. What's what's an ex is there? There's got to be an additional expense if we were going to incorporate like a September election. Does how, how does that whole process work? Does if there's several on because I think yeah, I think, I think, um, we're I think it's fair on Stowe. I think there's several there on September. Yeah, so September. then is there an additional expense? Oh May one. Yeah, but it's, it's not a lot. No, of no, it. for the September one then. So yes. since there's going to be an election, it's not a. It's not as much as it would be. It would it would be substituted for the May one. Right. It would right. be the same cost as the May one except September. Okay. Plus, there is already allowed for the fact that the primary only takes place if there are more than two people. Right. So if there's not, there won't even be a primary. Okay. It's true too. Yeah. All right. Is there anything else to add to that discussion? Move on to section 4.04, .04, vacancy in the office of mayor, a succession plan currently states in the event the office of mayor shall become vacant for any reason, the president of council shall thereupon become the acting mayor and serve for the unexpired term if such term is not in excess of six months or shall serve until the filling of such vacancy by the electorate of the city but shall not thereby cease to be a council member. When temporarily the president of council is absent or inaccessible or for any reason unable to perform the president of council's duties as acting mayor, then council by a vote of the majority of the remaining members of council shall designate one of their members to act as acting mayor. And I guess the, the, the problem here, I'll continue reading in a second, was we could have a draw, a, t a tie. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Mayor Prokop expressed need for discussion and clarification on this section, especially regarding the possibility that if the council president needed to take over mayoral duties, the vote of the remaining members of council could result in a tie. So possible suggestion, appoint an insider, director of finance, director of planning and community development, to temporarily handle the day-to-day -day running of the city, except that may not enter into any contracts until council can convene an emergency meeting to select one of the council members to serve. Uh, Russ, I put that in italics because that's just my mumblings and thoughts that I'm putting down there, thinking that if you're in a situation where the 
president of council cannot or does not want to take over that you need that you need to convene council which may not be able to be done within a day or two it may take maybe a week before they can do this in the meantime the city must have somebody overseeing my thoughts were either the two people who I think work really closely with the mayor are the director of finance or the director of um, planning and uh, that these were people who might be able to are aware of what where the city's at what they're working on who could just oversee things until council had the time to meet so that could be the band-aid to get us to a meeting right uh, that's what I'm I'm thinking um, that it it allows someone allows for someone to step in I mean everything we saw when we were looking at other charters everybody has a, a different way of doing it it seems mm -hmm. and what seemed to be the best that you saw well I, I like the idea that it's an elected official you know so if, if, if it's a vice mayor or if it's president of council vice president of council uh, you know uh, but I still like the idea of having a but elected official. But we don't have official. a vice mayor. I'm saying, and depending on what city it is. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, right. s when I went through the charter, some would say a, a vice mayor, some would say president of council. Mm -hmm. You have a vice president of council, but I just, personally, I like the idea that an elected official would do it instead of a, mm -hmm. someone that's an appointed person. Well, I think what Jenny was saying, th that just gets you to a meeting to elect somebody, but I see what you're saying. Do we have a vice president of council? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Is there any reason why it cannot be worked into the language that the vice president of council would serve? Macedonia does that. Mm -hmm. Gary, do you have any uh, any you know opinion on going from you know if the mayor cannot serve going to president of council and if unwilling or unable to do it going to vice president? I don't have any opinion. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, I, you know, if however it's resolved, I. I think we do need a solution because if the president of council cannot become the acting mayor, you very well could have a drop, at least six people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think there's this calls for some solution. And I like the idea of a department head. Um, maybe if it were just for a few days, that would be fine. But if it were for a long period of time till the next election, that would bother me because I guess somebody could claim that that's in conflict with the charter because the mayor has to be a resident. Department heads not, are not necessarily. So I wouldn't view it as that if it were an interim person, but I, I maybe somebody might. I, I don't know how it needs to be resolved, but I think that idea of leaving it up to six people could cause problems. I have a question, though. If, if the president of council cannot or will not take that position. Why can't he why or can't she vote? vote? Because right. Dave and I went over and over this because it says it's by a vote of the majority of the remaining members uh. of council. So, I mean, oh, could that could be an alternative. And I'm, I'm wondering, did, did David ever cite the reason why that was worked into the language? I don't know. I mean, he wasn't responsible yeah. for it, but I'm, I'm. Certainly wasn't there in '84, so I don't know. It just um, could be just a keyword uh, change. Could possibly you appoint someone? Uh, you know, prior what? to. Yeah, no, I, I don't think situation. that's. I think it's better to have a succession policy. I do too. Laid out, mm -hmm. and I, the president, vice president thing. Uh, Macedonia, I think there's a few other cities that do that. Th this is done all different ways. Mm. But, yeah, I think uh, the appointment by the mayor might be that too political. I don't think it would be a thing. Russ, what you're saying, though, is you're keying in on that word remaining. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. That probably calls for discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think e eliminating that word remaining and you know, just s 
council by a vote of council shall elect. The, the entire council. The entire council, right. Let's mm -hmm. be specific. If, well, if you take that, just if you just took that word out remaining, the sentence yeah. reads what kind of like where we want to be. By a vote of the majority of the members of council. Uh, the other, mm -hmm. and maybe it's not even an other, maybe it's just a. Uh, I think we should clarify. An amendment is clarified. If you're going to take out the remaining, I would put all remaining. If all council members? All yeah, members. or entire council. Members. Right, and right, that's yeah, definitely, I've made a note of that. Would but we want to put something in there saying that <laughs> must be an emergency meeting of council within 10 days? You know what, I'm, I'm just looking at all the kinds of things that could happen here. Okay, so it says, uh, if you put in of all council members, what if somebody refuses right. to vote? They keep That's recusing themselves, they don't come in. It's gotta be a majority, yeah. you know. And, and in I some way it has to be worded that it's a majority. Yeah. You know what, maybe you could say a super majority. No, that won't work either because in the in the Stowe Charter it does talk about a majority vote of mm -hmm. all members elected or appointed by council. So it covers the majority vote and it includes all members. Although it, it may be difficult depending on when it is to get all members right. convened. That's why, you know, to my original point when I brought this up at our first meeting or one of our first meetings. I just thought, you know, succession. again, yeah, succession mm -hmm. plan. Yeah, I almost think you're right, Drew, because but it could be. I know there was an issue in a neighboring city that went on for over a year mm -hmm. because always one they didn't want to vote on it, and always one council member was out. Mm -hmm. But if we do remove that remaining, um, would it would it work as far as council members voting then, if all council members could vote? if the president of council or the vice president of council both declined to take it, that the majority of the majority of all members of council mm -hmm. would would be the deciding factor? But the but answer may be both both of these things. Right. right. Uh, yeah. the, right. The, the secession plan though, and do we want to go beyond vice president of council? Would we I, I mean right now we would almost be designating a third office in council, but I mean. Well, the charter already does address that is shall designate one of their members to act as acting mayor. Mm -hmm. So, but maybe adding something more in the direct succession line than just president of council. So president, vice president, vice president. And then. A, a I mean, maybe it's just as easy as just adding if the uh, President of Council doesn't take it, then the Vice next President of Council does it. President if Vice President of yeah. Council does not take it, it, it goes, goes to, a, to vote a, a vote of all mm -hmm. council members. Mm -hmm. But that still leaves the period that I'm concerned about that there is this mayor for some reason is incapacitated, council vice or president doesn't want it, vice president doesn't want it, council has to meet. Who's going to be overseeing the business of the city for that five days or seven days until council does meet? Uh, you know, I think if it's just a, s a small period of time like mm -hmm. that, that's a little bit different than somebody taking on the duties for six months or a year. Right. The, the president has to fill in the president of council for a small period of time. I mean, that's his duty. He agrees to that when he becomes president. He doesn't agree to become acting mayor for two months or three months or six months, but he certainly agrees to take on the duties if the mayor. So you say by accepting the position of president, president of council, you are accepting the fact that should there be a short term, few days, one week um, problem with the mayor being able to serve, that is their job to step in and take it. The I only thing this is saying is they are not obligated to become the acting mayor until the next election. I would agree, Gary, do you agree to that? Yeah, I agree with you. Okay. If and we, um, Kathy, to your your point earlier about um, people may, if it says all members of council as far as the majority for vote, maybe it would should say if if that's the way you go, all members of council present, because you still have to have um, a certain number to have a meeting anyway, 
Uh, True. And if you have somebody, majority of it. if you have somebody duck in a meeting to avoid the vote, it won't affect it so as long as the rest of council is there. If if there was a vice uh, vice president of, of council, if if so, we're saying this word remaining could stay in there because if there's uh, the president of council refuses, so now there's six council members. The vice president refuses. There's now five members and there won't be a tie. Well, there you go. That's true too. The word remaining doesn't have to go anywhere if vice president is added. So it's one or the other. They don't both need to be there. Because you'd get down to five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now whether that would be five present members or five, you know, however that wording, but adding the vice president of council would remove the issue of there being a tie with the remaining vote. God willing, we'll never get to this point. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. We're in it deep tonight, all right. Yeah. <laughs> in, in all fairness, though, um, just because a president and or vice president is not able, maybe they have a full-time job, they're not able to take the position, I still think they would want to have a have vote. A say. Have the vote, right. yeah. yeah. Okay. And I can agree. I agree with that. I would agree. Yeah. And I think you can, you can juggle the numbers, but basically, so you say it's six. Well, you have the meeting and one person can't make it. Now you have five. Right. You know, there's, <laughs> there's always going to be that possibility of having an odd or an even number, even right. if you do all seven council members. Right. I think the odds are in our favor if we have a line of succession that says the president of council, the vice president of council, the majority of council. It, you know, we would have to really be <laughs> something yeah, really odd. I, I uh, think so, too. You probably wouldn't get down to that third level, hopefully. But... I can always throw rock, paper, scissors in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you read the other charters, though, uh, I mean, that's pretty standard. They just have, I think, a better – they don't set themselves up for a 3-3 three, three vote like we do. Right. Yeah, so this definitely does. So if we have vice president council, that will eliminate it, right? Okay. Yep. Section 4.05, the powers of the mayor. Clarification of language to state that the mayor shall serve as the director of public safety or have the ability to appoint a director of public safety who would serve at the pleasure of the mayor. And currently ours says, subject to provisions of the civil service regulations and the provisions of this charter, the mayor shall have the power to appoint, promote, discipline, transfer, reduce, or remove any employee of the city except those required by this charter to be elected, those whose terms of office may be fixed by this charter, the director of public safety, the director of public service, and all appointed officers. Now, wasn't there a reference, Jenny, back to another section of the charter that um, said? Yes, there was, where it once again addresses. Um, but that didn't need to be changed. It was no. only this section that needed to be changed. It really needs to be clarified, because in most cities of this size, it, it's fairly standard practice, I believe, for the mayor to also serve. It is, and some of the charters even state that. Like Macedonia says, the director of public safety shall be the head of the Department of Public Safety. The mayor, in addition to his or her other duties, shall be and, perf and shall perform the duties of the director of public safety. I just think we need to add that in there. I do, too. And Dave said if we added here, the mayor shall be the director of public safety, unless he or she designates someone to be the director of public safety, that would cover, we wouldn't need to change the other section then. That would leave that open in case the mayor did designate somebody. Then, of course, they have authority over that person. So that's the way he approached it. The thing that uh, the director of public service really, I th think that whole thing needs to be re reworded. We have a director of public works. Oh, so you're saying we don't even have Why a are we calling that person out, you know, the director of public safety and all appointed officers rather than director of service? I'm not quite sure. I, it's just old language, I believe, that was never changed. Because we have the director of engineering. We have director of community planning and development. We have the director of parks and recreation, of public works. And it's odd that they would just call, call out the director of service. Public, public service, service, that works? Yeah, it 
they're no different than all appointed officers who serve at the pleasure of the mayor. So do you feel we should name out all the directive officers? Or I don't think that's necessary because that can change too. Right. Um, so I would say it would be better just to leave that open-ended a point of officers because directors are appointed, but take out the director of public service. There's really no reason to call them out. So that sentence would start with all appointed officers shall serve at the pleasure of the mayor? Right. Yeah, it just seems redundant. Yeah, there, there's no, yeah, they're the same as all other appointive positions, yeah. director of service. Yeah. Does everybody agree with that? I mean, I, I, yeah. Yeah. I think it harks back to many, many years ago when the city was pretty much fire, police, and plowing the road service. I mean, those were your three big departments, mm -hmm. public safety and service. What, do you agree that we sh should still amend it, that the mayor shall be the chief executive officer of the city and serve as the director of public safety? So we do need that in. So this I is basically just some rewording which yeah. David can put together and submit to Absolutely. us. Absolutely. And that I have no doubt. I receive mail at my office all the time from the day one, uh, Mayor Prokop, director of public safety. I mean, that's pretty typical of all cities. And okay. Any further discussion on that? Move right along to section 6.01, limitation on rate of taxation. Currently, the power of council to levy taxes shall be subject to the limitations, requirements, and allowances provided by the Constitution and the laws of the state of Ohio, but shall include the right to levy taxes for all purposes of the municipality and in bold, without a vote of the people. The vote is mine. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I understand that. Uh, which shall not exceed or accumulate beyond a maximum of seven mills in any one year, and which shall include the right to levy taxes upon such other subjects <coughs> and for such other purposes that are lawful under the Constitution and laws of the state of Ohio, becoming effective January 1st, 1973. Request a clarification of mills. One mill equals one-tenth of one cent. Property value of 100,000 times point <coughs> oh oh one zero times seven mills equals $700. Now that was my interpretation of, we were talking about seven mills because we had the question, mm -hmm. well, how much is that? Every year, what's a mill? Right, 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 what's a mill and if council can decide we're going to add seven mills, how much does that mean to a property owner? You know, what kind of money is that? The city can only have 10 inside millage. Yeah. Um, that's what we're allowed by state law, so we could not go beyond that. Everything beyond 10 mills would have to be voted on by the public. So. Okay, but I'm still trying to figure out if council, for some reason, decided to levy seven mills, how much would that be on a typical homeowner with the valuation of a hundred thousand dollars on their house and property? Seven hundred. It would be seven hundred. Yes. Okay. So we we can't exceed ten without going to the vote. What are we at right now? Less Zero. Than Well, the taxable value, absolutely, assessed value. I'm sorry, when you said 100,000, I thought of assessed value because it is a, of assessed value. Right, right. And, I can right. Send you and that's what I, I, They have that formula too on their website as well. It, when I said the formula last time, I did say assessed value. You so. did. But you said under the Ohio State Charter, cities can go up to 10 mills? We can, but we're restricted here to but seven But we're restricted mills. internally by our, our right. charter. Exactly. That's my understanding of it, Terry. So we, we couldn't allow but David 12 mills, but we can restrict it 
we couldn't go beyond the maximum set can't by the state the guards, maximum but we can of inside millage set by restrict it. So okay. And that's from 1973, so that's probably worth it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just writing notes, folks. Sorry. 6.03, contracts and purchasing. 7.01, general provisions. And 7.05, civil service commission. Reword to allow for important information, advertising of bids and public notices through online electronic methods. Mr. Sengstock commented that not all residents have internet and that newsprint publications are the way they receive city information. He advises the commission to use caution when making language cha changes so as to not exclude any members of the public from communications. I think this is a really good point that you made because, you know, there are a lot of people that don't, I mean, uh, and, and I know from being on Ethan's Green, a lot of people didn't receive the newsletter that we sent out because they didn't have uh, email. So I think it has to be a combination. Um, so I'm in total agreement with you. Yep, I would agree too. And I think this was more or less just to allow for the city and whatnot to go on to that mm -hmm. online thing to, to get bids. and for that and also, you know, to post for job advertisements, right. meetings, so that we have, the, can do it either or, or both. We have an and or. And or. Mm -hmm. Now, the, as I referenced those three different sections here, would each one of those require a separate, um, a separate um, ballot issue? I, Dave and I talked about that also, and he felt that if we, structured it in such a way that it affected all sections, that all advertising could be done. So it could be done. Then we could change it. Right. Okay. In one. In fact, I, he was going to be working on he putting he something together and then emailing it. He mentioned he would do that. Okay. He was going to put right. some wording together and then email all the board members his suggested wording. Okay, good. All right, moving on to 705B, Civil Service Commission, amend to show the definition of both the competitive and non-competitive groups. See City of Twinsburg Civil Service Rule and Regulations booklet for definition of the competitive group. And I, I, I think that was a good suggestion just because you read that thing and you don't know what the, right. what the, the, the non-competitive was it or which? Um, let's see, so if the civil service regulation booklet has the competitive, then the charter has the non-competitive. Right. And the booklet for civil service doesn't have non-competitive, it only has, so both of them need to be reworded. Just for clarification purposes, I, I, I agree with you there. Does anybody else have any? I'm in agreement and we have the uh, employee handbook and really they spell out classified, unclassified, certified, provisional. Um, they, everything is spelled out there and we're going, Dave will put together language from the handbook because neither civil service or the charter I think is very clear on that. So he, we're gonna start working that from scratch. All right, moving on to articles. Before you go on. Yes. Um, and backing up just a, a little bit in uh, 705A, uh, isn't that, Mayor, isn't that where we wanted to clarify some of the, um, we had some of those old things hanging in there that we don't have responsibility for? Yes. Public library, school. Absolutely. School board, and this uh, number 11 and 13 under A. So we're at 705? 705A. Yep. At least 11 and 13 do not apply. Because they're not part of the, uh, they don't report to. Neither does number two, yeah. unless we leave it all directors of departments because we don't have a, these just, just are not accurate anymore. These have changed over the years, these positions. 
again, are we, is this something that Dave would want to? He's already, we've already submitted this to the ballot twice, and I don't believe that we ever had good explanation to why we were changing it. It was never passed, and this, this is really pretty vital because it. Are we sure we did not do something with this? Because for some reason, the copy of the charter, not the one that I just got today that is the quote unquote amended one, but the one that was handed out to us at the beginning does not have, it, it stops at 10. Right, but it failed. What we have originally mm -hmm. apparently failed, right. but this is what still exists. Yep, they didn't change. So this is what was proposed. Walt yeah, Walter Drain never, they just, they just published what we gave, what we put on the ballot rather than going back and looking at the results. Yeah. So this one failed, okay. That, failed. that, that clears that up. Because <laughs> you're right, it doesn't have those 10, 11, mm -hmm. or it doesn't okay. have 11, 12, but it failed. Okay. Yeah, if you go to the next one. David's going to be putting together? Yes, he is. Okay. <coughs> it may be similar to what you have mm -hmm. in that other one that didn't <laughs> yeah. <have>. Right. <laughs> I <laughs> think it's the same. same. Yeah. same. Uh, we ready to move on to Article 7? Administrative departments, commissions, and boards. Currently, council appoints all boards and commissions members Mayor or mayor's delegated representative shall be an ex officio non-voting member. Mayor distributed in her office memo outlining her proposal for appointment of board and commission members. Was that done at the last meeting? That was in 09. Oh, no, we didn't go over that. No. Okay. Um, no, we didn't go over it, but you handed it out at right. the last meeting. Yes. I don't have, do you, would you, would you happen to have? Yeah, I do. And I'm not saying this is the way it should be done. I'm just All right, anybody have any opinions on yeah. this? Yeah, this is the one that uh, I had brought up before initially. And while I was going through charters, and, and then I read the, I read the minutes from uh, 2009, and, um, and, they did, and they did the background. You were probably heard that, Russ. And, and there's, there's no other uh, city in Summit County where the mayor doesn't have some, you know, when you talk about appointing, that the mayor doesn't appoint some. So, and, and I think that's, that's illustrated here. So, and uh, again, just like the meeting, you know, we're the one that's, everyone else is doing a certain way that set up a council meeting. That doesn't mean we're wrong, but again, you know, we're anomaly again. And um, I just like the checks and balances of a uh, mayor at least having an appointment. You know, and, and you weren't here, Russ, but I, I, I brought an example of the charter review. You have one person from every ward that has to be on the charter. You have nine people. So, so that's five people. You have four more, you know, to me, Having a mayor maybe select you know a couple one or two people in that and some of the other commissions that the mayor would select one no matter you know it's, this isn't about Mayor Prokop this is about whoever's mayor right um, that they would have some input too so that that's the reason I brought it up again I'm not saying because we're the only one that doesn't allow the mayor to do it that we're wrong but it's it is curious it's kind of like when a you know a teacher gives a test and the kids all get an F you wonder if it's the kids or the teacher. So in this case, <laughs> I'm kind of wondering if we're right or wrong about this. I, I, and I'm, I just favor a more balanced approach. So. You know, it's, it's under the miscellaneous, but if you look at the very last item under miscellaneous, where Mr. Metropolis suggests ward designations for service on boards and commissions be removed, using the fact that sometimes you get three people from one ward and no people from other wards leaving the position open um, which has happened and some commissions don't require it like our commission doesn't require it we have several people here from the same ward I think that's because you know th there are some some commissions that have truly direct impacts on specific wards mm -hmm. we don't and, you know, we're mm -hmm. we don't right. have any influence over any specific ward the, the charter really governs the city mm -hmm. it doesn't dictate what ward has a golf course in it. And right, the only thing that would change, say if you have a uh, 
a five-member board. If there were not ward designations, you could say council can appoint four and the mayor can appoint one. But when you have council, I mean, ward designations, you can't divide it up that way. So are you saying you don't believe the mayor should have any input? No. In, in the boards and commissions? No, I'm saying what I said is that, and the mayor does have input because she, she can sit in on all the interviews of board and commission members and make her feelings known. She's not a voting member, though. But she's not a voting member. Yeah. But I said, be, if we have a commission now that is made up of one person from each ward, you can't, what do you say? Okay, Mayor, you, get, you can vote on the person from Ward 4. You know, do we either then modify boards and commissions to have one at large? And actually, I believe some of our boards and commissions do. Or do you do away with the requirement that you must have one person from each ward? I mean, it's just something to think of. I'm not really advocating right. anything at this point, just offering some, some different points of view to look at. So, so Gary, or, or Jenny, if you know, when, when there are appointments to commissions that are specific to a ward, and say Russ Sipen from Ward 3 comes in because he wants to get on Parks and Rec. Mm -hmm. Who makes that decision, council as a whole, or does the, the council person from Ward 3 simply have that? Council as a whole. As a whole, okay. But um, to address something that Jan Jenny m mentioned here, um, in the event, as happened just this December, we don't get applicants from a ward maybe consider the possibility in that event to be able to appoint. Because we had people who applied, but they were in the wrong ward and we right. couldn't use them. Uh, people wanted to be involved and we, we could not appoint them. Um, that doesn't resolve this whole thing of involving the mayor, though, and I understand that. And I, and I thought all along that the mayor should have some involvement. I, I have no problem with that. That's my personal feeling. Russ, I think that's a point well taken that I would rather have in the event of ha instead of having a vacancy if no one's applied that we could go outside of the ward and and uh, have someone come in I think that's important oh I agree absolutely I, I would agree if, if you did away with ward sometimes you've had some excellent applicants and they come from all of them say from one ward I, you know it's a shame to turn people down that are qualified and uh, even more than that, people who have the interest and the enthusiasm, they're going to show up and be dedicated. I mean, you know, it's rather than begging somebody, I need somebody from Ward 3, would you please, yeah. you know, and that has happened too. And we just had to do that. Yeah. We had to go out and find people to fill ward positions in two different cases. And you're right, that, that is a problem. If you might have mm -hmm. three applicants from one ward, that two of them are excellent candidates, one applicant from another ward, which is maybe a, a weak applicant, but you have to bypass the person who has the background and would, would do well, the knowledge that's needed for that position, because the charter requires that we must take one from each ward. Are there any cities that, uh, do other cities all do it this way for their boards and commissions? I, I really don't know, honestly. We're the only one, you think, Pete? Hmm. You think we're the only one? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's, I don't know that. that's something to think of. Look at some of the other charters and see if they put that requirement on. Oh, I, I agree. I, we have proof that <laughs> it can get in the way <laughs> and be detrimental. That's valid. Going back to the um, power of the mayor to appoint, though, uh, th has anyone given consideration other than I, I, I'll look at the mayor's memo. Uh, <coughs> so there's that, I believe, asking for um, certain commissions and boards. Uh, is there any other thing that could come into play there? Does just granting you the ability to 
have a say, Mayor, a vote? Well, I, I think uh, at the very least, I think the mayor should be a voting member when it comes to appointments. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, where are we? Seven twelve Department of Parks and Rec. <laughs> Very sparse. Yeah, only one sentence. Um, Kim, you yes, you, you brought a and I printed it off. You brought some examples from quite a few cities. I did. I shared some e examples last week, um, and um, as I looked through these, I mean, you can see we go from from one to two paragraphs in some charters to to very detailed in in other charters. If I could call your attention to page three, it was the uh, Macedonia. A yep. couple of their sections, sections 13.2, 13.3, and 13.4, seem to really encapsulate the function of the director of Parks and Rec duties and qualifications. And if we wanted to go in more detail, it does go into staffing and removal and those kinds of things. But I thought at least those three sections really captured. Did the other ones just seem like I, I didn't, I will admit I didn't read Hudson's or any of these other ones yet because I just printed it off mm -hmm. before I came here? More specific to their needs in their particular city and more um, less detailed. It would be something that we could talk about to decide where we want okay. to go with it. I think we, we pretty much agree we want to pursue mm -hmm. this further just to mm -hmm. get a little detail yeah. there. As a suggestion, yeah. what about um, sending your document, to Kim's document, to um, Derek Schroeder to take a look at? Since he's a Parks and Rec person, so he could take a look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. okay. Can you do that? I'd Can be happy to. Okay. okay. Maybe you can give us input. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kim. All right, on to 7A01. The wording and intent are vague. Needs to be reworded to allow for better interpretation of intent. Sally Gadosh would like to see the commission enact some sort of penalty action when the city is found to have violated section 7A01. In the first one, um, Last week, David Maestro did agree that the way it is worded now, it doesn't lend itself to a clear interpretation all the time. And, um, you know, he does think that some rewording of some sort is necessary. Um, Sally's point was to enact a penalty action to... Um, encourage the city not to violate that section of the charter. And I think Mr. Sangstock brought that up as well. Um, don't courts enact penalties? Absolutely. I mean, and, and that's, right. that, that's my opinion on that right there. I agree. Yep. Mr. Metropolis brought up a good point last week. Um, as the commission, we need to be more um, general and what we want to see done. We don't need to s necessarily list s specific details and everything in the charter because um, some of those things are not under our control or shouldn't be potentially under our control. We obviously, we're guidelines, we're listing guidelines, but like we just brought up, um, if, if it gets to that point, the courts need to decide penalties and so forth. That's right. Us as a commission. Now expand on, on, on the first bullet point. What, what so, David Maestros agreed that it needed to be reworded mm -hmm. and, and cleared up. Dean, do you remember to exactly the advantage what of he said it. Um, I I think that he said the way it's worded is not the intent is not clear. Yeah, that it's very vague. That um, it needed sort clarity. of leaves itself to being interpreted different ways. 
by clarity. By different people. Yeah, that's what he people. said. Well, I, I, I know the whole, you know, you know the, the, the crux of this argument today, if you're going to cite an example, is the current lawsuit against the city yep. where the council voted to change the height, and it is Sally's argument that height changes it's somehow use. the zoning and use. that needs to be voted upon by the people. So th that's kind of like where some of this vagueness is right now because I've read David Maestros' argument and I've read Warner Mendenhall's argument. And you can sit there and go, all right, we'll see what the court says. Right now I believe the court's kind of just hanging out and I don't think they're waiting for anything. They're no, we're waiting for their decision. Um, I think we probably, without a doubt, want to look at 7A01, but does anybody else besides me have a problem with trying to get something on a ballot right now while there's a current lawsuit against the city, which we, with whatever we put on the ballot may look like it is favoring one side over the other? I, I don't, see, I don't I see that as an issue. You no? don't? No. I, and I think that on this, you know, what uh, Mr. Maestro has talked about, I think Jay or somebody else brought it up, is the clarity. He just wants clarity. He said either way you go, he just wants it clear. Because right now it's up to, a, like you said, the judge, and they don't know which way it's going to go. So, uh, you know, I think that what Mr. Maestro's, what would, what would be good is if he came up with the clarity and he wrote it, and we could always get another opinion That's if we want. That's what he stated. Yeah. yeah. Another, you know, two weeks from our, our last meeting yeah. was that he would have uh, something, you know, for us to review. Right. And I think that's the right way to go. Yeah. And then we can review it. And he'll be here next week. And I think this really deserves, you know, his input, an entire yeah. meeting, and lots of discussion. So uh, yeah. our next meeting isn't until the 31st. So oh, that's right. We have that. Yeah. See, and he's on the off week that we left him. I thought he said maybe he, he was answer. okay with this. Yeah, he was okay with the 31st. Yeah. And yeah, then he, he would make it every should be because that's the fifth, right? Plus the example that Mr. Maestros gave was um, due to. A vague interpretation. We recently went to the ballot to determine the color of rain barrels because of the way that. Um, oh uh, no! I right. I I I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to throw. A, I don't want to throw a vibe out to anybody in the public that we're kind of not taking any shots at anybody, especially Dave Maestro, who I have great respect for but I don't want it to appear that we're placing the fox in charge of security of the hen house. You know, there's a, there's a pending lawsuit right now. That's the bottom line. Well, his, his whole point is the reason there's a lawsuit is because there's no clarification. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, it, and he interpreted it one way, and it's obviously been interpreted another way. I totally <laughs> agree with that. So what if we change this and we, we get an amendment and we still haven't had a decision from the court and it gets on the ballot in November and whatever's decided pretty much makes up, it spells it out right there. It, it, the lawsuit will go this way or it will go this way. You know what, Russ, I think it would be a good idea if, if this commission gets prepared. You, you develop the language oh, that, I totally be that prepared. you want to get on the ballot. The, and the ballot's a long way away. It's November. So hopefully we'll have a decision before then. But even if we don't, um, this could always go on the ballot on, at a later date at a different election as long as you approve the language, make the recommendation to council, and council agrees. So I think it's well worth the time and effort, and I know you do too. I like that idea. To, to put it together and get something going on it. I agree. Okay. You know, plus the fact that the commission – doesn't meet again for five years. Right. And this has mm -hmm. given the city a number of ongoing problems mm -hmm. over the years. So it, it really needs to be clarified. Well, it does, but there are other ways for things to get on the ballot. For instance, council can place it on the ballot without the Charter Review Commission. You know, so if by chance, and I'm all for, I think, being prepared mm -hmm. and just saying, you know, the Charter Review Commission does endorse this, you know, this is a good start, but let's see how the lawsuit pans out if it's not settled by the November election. And we don't want it to not be settled by then, but God knows it's the courts, so who knows? If one side wins, the other may appeal. Um, 
things can get things can get dragged on for quite some time. So, but I think to have have our ducks in a row mm -hmm. makes a ton of sense. Knowing too that say the November uh, election comes and goes and this is settled in December, council can place that on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So, all right, good. All right, we're gonna get into the miscellaneous section now if there's nothing else to be discussed on that. Need for charter language to be updated in all areas to replace his with his, her, or he, she. We tried to do that a couple times. Right, we probably we missed this. some. Yes. <laughs> You're, we're not the only uh, char that's missed some because as you read through them once in a while, you'll see. Yeah. You know, but I think legally, you it, it doesn't matter because okay. you can have a he in it in, in our language. There's some languages that there's a word for both. Yeah. In, in English language, there's not. Right. I remember studying that in business law many years ago, but um, so uh, you know if we miss a couple, but I think it's a good idea to clean it up. But I as you go through, I think the it's other good to clean it up. But what about what what if we 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 gave the law director the ability to clean up language as long as it did not change the spirit of the article that we're addressing. So a misspelling could be changed without having to be put on the ballot. Or the word he or she can be removed and replaced with it or whoever they, they, they want right. to put on. He addressed person. that and said, basically the same thing. So instead of playing editor and going through each and every one, which we can do if we want to, but at least, you know, no. point it out to the, the law director and he has the ability to do that. Uh, under section 1002 he does, and in fact he's going to work on the renumbering as we talked a little bit earlier or last time about putting all of the <coughs> departments together, putting the boards and commissions so that everything is laid out in a better manner. So he has that ability in 1002. And I agree with you, Drew. I've been functioning under that language yeah. for 15 years, and it's <laughs> yeah. so far hasn't presented a problem. Some of them have done a really nice job by just putting he slash she. Yeah. You know, but once in a while fine. they've missed a couple, and it would be nice, like you said, Russ, to clean it there up. There you go. Great. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Suggestion to allow for online access to the journal records. Uh, a, a charter issue or just a no. city right the, just group functionality of the the city government and access to the public right. since I put it on there because it came out of one of our meetings right mm -hmm. the beginning, yeah. Mr. Sangstock asked commission to look into the pros and cons of city manager versus strong mayor forms of government Mrs. Gadosh states that in the 70s there was a city manager form of government. So, but it was changed for some reason and I, does anybody have a feeling on, on, on that? I truly, truly, truly do not believe it is the Charter Review Commissions to change the structure of city government, but if the people want to do that, there's got to be a way that they can legally get something like that on a ballot. Referendum. A Petition. referendum. Uh, you know, I, obviously I'm a proponent of a mayor form of government. Yeah. I have seen city managers um, come and go because they are hired and fired by councils. And there's been cities that have had two or three in the same year. Pete knows some history on city managers and maybe he has. And I really believe it's a function of the residents to decide who is going to be the executive of their city. Well, and, and if you leave it up, if, if otherwise you have a council, and they're elected, uh, you know, granted you that, they're elected, but I, I, I sort of think that that should be to the vote of the people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's I agree, and I don't know, I'm sorry, Drew, go no, ahead. I was gonna say, it's the, in my opinion, having grown up in a city manager form of government, the difference, uh, to your point, Mayor, is having four people decide who, who the CEO of the city is versus 51% of the general public so as a voter. That's why I just like the mayor form of government. And in that example, you know, th there are city managers that could be there for 25 years and then some, I, you know, to your example, I, where I grew up, they were changed pretty quickly. Neither one was great in my view. <laughs> 25 years or changing quickly, you know? <laughs> so, but, um, but you know, I, I think that, I mean, like you said, Russ, if, if 
people really wanted by a referendum, mm. you know, and it doesn't look like the council chambers are filled here screaming for a city manager. <laughs> I, I wasn't <laughs> around in Twinsburg at the time that they changed from a <coughs> city manager to a mayor. Uh, but what instigates that change? I, I'm curious, and Lauren, you, you, you may know. I, 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 who, who came up with the idea at the time? Well, actually, I don't think, Lauren, how long have you lived here? A couple of years? Seven years. Seven. I've been here since 1977, and that was one of the first issues I voted on. Oh, so what inspired it? Well, from my understanding, uh, there was a lot of contention among council members about who the city manager was going to be, and it changed frequently. And Mayor Parisi put it was able to get it on the ballot, and it was changed in, I believe, 1981. Okay. Now, yes, Lauren. based on that, that question, leave the personalities out of this for a moment. From a professional standpoint, I've worked in both city manager forms of government and in mayor council forms of government. It really is a function of the Charter Review Commission to look at those areas. In other words, some Charter Review Commission in the past thought this should be a city manager form of government, and then it changed. The function of change is who wants to have what form of government, the benefits and minuses. Um, a city manager is appointed by the elected council people. So there are how many council people? Seven? Seven. Okay, you got seven council people here that would interview city managers, talk to those city managers, and then make a determination of which one has the professional credentials, experience, and the I areas of what they're looking for, the talents they want for their community. When you have a elected mayor position, what you're dealing with is, is there any qualifications for the mayor to be an elector? You have to live in the city for a period of time, doesn't say you have to know anything about city government, but you certainly should. Can you learn? Yes, you can. Can you go to classes? Yes, you can. I think the city manager form of government, when you point to, yes, it can be changed. Because if you have seven people running a city here and the city manager's doing a bad job, you have the ability of those seven people to get rid of them. And that's a big plus in a lot of respect. There is some issues as far as institutional knowledge. But I think one of the things you look at for mayor versus city manager, I think when your city gets to a certain size, like Twinsburg, I mean, the budget this year was $54 million. Last year, other years, it's $40 million. That's a lot of money. And there's a lot of uh, information and professional credentials you need to be a city manager. Uh, I was a finance director, but I know I've worked with city managers. They have a broad base of knowledge. And, you know, the mayor's force, she was on council. Then she moved into the, the mayor's position. So she had the ability to say, yeah, I know a little bit about city government. But, you know, do mayors, as a general rule, from a standpoint as a citizen voting on a form of government, does a mayor automatically walk in and know what it takes to be the director of public safety? No. You have to have tenure. You have to have understanding. You've got to have a lot of education in those, in my opinion, in a community this size. And population and budget size, in my personal opinion, should determine a lot of things with government, but people don't always look at it that way. But again, city manager, professional credentials, the person can be changed if you're not getting the results you want. If you elect the mayor, an elected person, and you don't get the results you want, then you're stuck with it for four years unless you can use the key word referendum. And let me assure you, referendum is a, is a real well-known political word in Ohio for make it as difficult as possible for the people to go out and really get organized to fight some position that the government is taking. So referendum, although it exists, it isn't an easy process. It's a very cumbersome process. So is recalling. It's a cumbersome process. But back to the question, city manager, form of government, I believe it warrants investigation, but you have to do it from a perspective of the old Ben Franklin T thing, okay? Positive negative. What's the good things about elected mayor, the bad things about elected? Same thing with city manager. I think if you look at it from that perspective, then you could determine whether or not your city is of a size and an operational complexity where you should have a city manager. 
this city is a very complex organization. If you look at it, uh, you know, we have eight bargaining units, 160 plus employees, $54 million budget. Does any one of you up there think, hey, I could run for mayor and I could be the CEO of that tomorrow? And I don't necessarily agree that it should always just be somebody from council that's been here for 10 years to be your mayor, because it may not always be. Um, so a lot of things can happen when you have to look at it and consider it. Just weigh all the different pluses and minuses, because they do exist out there for those forms of government. That's all I wanted to say, unless you have other questions for me. Yep. Thanks, Lori. Does anybody have anything else to add to that? Since we're making some comments. <laughs> make, make sure you state, state your name. Okay, Pete McRoffice, 9044 Gettysburg Drive, Springfield, Ohio. And uh, Lori and I have disagreed on issues in the past. But I will agree with him on this one. There are pluses and minuses. I have worked for city managers, I have worked for mayors. Depends on who you get. Some good city managers, bad ones. Some good mayors, and bad ones. So, it's there are pluses and minuses. Like he says, there are certain thresholds you reach as far as budgets and city sizes and stuff. The old rule of thumb when I was in graduate school was: you have 5,000 people or less, you have a mayor. You have 50,000 people or more, you have a mayor. Yeah, between 5,000 and 50,000, you have a city manager. That's where the rule of thumb. I don't know how, how good it stands up to today. And as far as mayors and city managers here in the city of Twinsburg, I believe we started off in 1957 with the mayor. And then we changed it to the city manager and then we changed it to the city manager. There are pluses and minuses like Lauren said. So wait on them, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I would definitely agree. There's pluses and manage uh, pluses and minuses to both of those things. But I lived through a period here in town where it was very contentious uh, city managers, and they were coming and going frequently. And there were some very good ones that got let go, unfortunately. I don't know. It, it just seems that when you have seven people in charge of who's going to run the city, that actually four. Well, good point. Unless it's a it super majority, then yeah. it would be five, <laughs> you know. But uh, could be four. <laughs> that's I, I I don't know. Uh, and, and I'll just throw out this that this too. <coughs> as much as I believe it would be, as much as I don't like the primary election, and if it were up to me, I would do away with it tomorrow. But I think a lot of people would be offended at that. I think it would be very very hard to convince people that they no longer have the chance to vote for mayor that we're going to have, you know, a, let, let's look at a city manager. Just my opinion. Yeah. Moving on. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sangstock submitted the following suggestions. Full or part-time employees should not be eligible to appointment to boards or commissions to avoid conflict of interest. And I think that the, the one thing that came up at least was when you looked at a part-time employee or, or or something where I think the example is what if the guy was a lifeguard at the pool mm -hmm. would like to uh, get his feet wet no pun intended on, on a board or commission <laughs> uh, full-time employees does does anybody have anything to chime in on, on that one the council has the ability to not approve that person to a commissioner board right well, they do. But this this would have more or le more or less put it in stone that you, you, you couldn't. And I think maybe if we wanted to address that, is to look at altering the language so that it would address somehow that where there's not a conflict of interest on the part of that board or commission member like somebody who works in park and rec serving on the park and recreation board. We, we already have that, um, you know, some people serve on boards in the city that do business with the city, and then they recuse themselves when they vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 
fact, capital improvements, that was one of the things, one of the members actually put in a bid for some work, so then he recused himself. So I don't know if I'm opposed to that, but that's a good point, you know, if we, uh, if we put that in there. But then you would eliminate some people, you know. All right. Well, I think it warrants mm -hmm. yeah. some discussion. Absolutely. Yeah. The mayor and finance director submit proposed five-year forecast slash operating budget to council at the end of each year. And I can remember the mayor looked at that and said, this looks like a job description of the finance director. And I believe our finance director is here this evening to address that. And it, it is. <laughs> Take it away, <laughs> Karen. Correct. Um, Does everybody Justin, know? I, I'm sorry, I, who don't know me, I'm Karen House, the finance director um, for the city of Twinsburg. Um, and to answer your question, I totally agree with what the mayor stated. It's policy and procedures. And the charter pretty much gives the foundation of establishing a department. It gives me and the mayor directive to how she or the mayor, he or she, wants the department to be ran. And with the expectations, it gives the council the um, directive of saying we want reports at a certain time. Um, currently, the way we operate now is that council gets their budget and information and revenue forecasting start of August. And we have layers and layers and layers before we even adopt a budget. We have charter, we have the, um, not charter, we have the uh, capital improvements board. That's a layer that looks over the, car the capital proposed. Jenny Spear has been on it for a very long time True. and been over it. Um, there's procedures before we even get to that. So council gets the first review of the budget starting in August. So um, I think we're ahead of the game of the process. We're very proactive as far as engaging council. Then after it goes to the capital simultaneously, it goes to the finance, the, uh, finance committee. They review it. We have hearings layered on that. Whatever finance committee gets, council gets. And when council wants to come in on the finance committee, they come. And the same applies to the charter, I mean to the um, capital improvements. Same thing. They are all invited to come and they review at the same time that the capital improvement as well as the finance committee. So these are policies that they're recommending and it should not be in a charter. And we operate 90 days prior to. This, this year actually was the first year that we didn't have 90 days, but because we were implementing a new software and we were installing it. So we were a little bit short than what we normally are. But we involved in the department as far as the gathering budgets and revenue projections the How far do you project out? Well, and, and that's interesting. Um, here, this year, we had a projection last year we do per year. However, capital improvement, when we're talking about what our capital improvements are, we have a capital improvement fund. And so how we fund that. So what we do is here's what the projected projects are. We have discussions actively about what we're going to fund, how we're going to fund it, how much money should be in the capital improvement fund. So it's not, it's almost as if to say finance and council are not receiving information when indeed they are. We have a policy that it will be funded by $3 million. $3 million um, to have at least the ending balance of that and we fund it in that way. So we do have policy and procedures in place and it, we don't need a charter because we're ahead of what's being proposed. As far as the, um, the ending one that said 120 days thereafter, the mayor presents a state of the city address every year that recaps the performance of the city going ahead and then also indicates and discusses 2014 or the current. So there's also information provided as well. So again, this is a policy um, suggestion and as far as you put in a charter. So every time the mayor or council, a new council, a new mayor comes in and wants to make a change, we have to go to four vote for that to make that change. You know, it's a Ru policy. Russ, I just want to state, is, is this another point that we're starting to define the charter a little bit too specific as opposed to more of a general right. wording on issues? Um, that's my only concern. I agree. The uh, charter should establish the departments. It establishes the Department of Law, Department of Finance, Department of Public Safety, Public Works, Public uh, Parks and Recreation was just added. 
Um, so it really sets up the department. But once you get into the policies of the department, those have to remain flexible. Yeah. Now, I know when I was on capital improvement, we did get forecasts mm -hmm. from the department. I yeah. don't know currently what you, one year we had five. Five is, for most things, is fairly useless. Three I Correct. found very good because what happens, you get four years down, it's all different. Stuff happens is but what you're saying. But typically right. next year and the this. year after, it, it gives you something mm -hmm. to look at to see, well, there's, there's a big thing coming he down here two years right. down the road, so we need to take that into consideration mm -hmm. because it could affect what we're working on or what or that two years down the road could be affected by our decisions we're making for the coming year. So it, it's really nice to have mm -hmm. forecasts, and, and they're very handy. Every year the departments update their five-year capital. That is a requirement. And, and the mayor yeah. requires that usually in August as well. Yes, absolutely. Yes, Lauren. Since it was my idea, I'd like a, just a few minutes to speak on that issue. Um, it is not uh, a part of a job description, nor is it part of a policy. What it is is part of what's called financial planning. The city currently, although Karen, I agree with her in the procedural aspects of what she does in preparation of the city's budget, many people may not understand if that's all done according to the law. The law of the state of Ohio dictates when a tax budget is done, when the budgets have to be submitted. And like with the schools, if anybody's familiar with the schools, it's a law, okay? A charter is a, a law, and all I'm stipulating is that if you want, as a community, to have a five-year forecast from your government for our financial planning, for not only the current year budget to comply with Ohio, but yes, I am asking that you could look at doing an additional four-year forecast, like the capital plan, they're currently doing is five years. But if you look at the whole city operations as a whole, five-year planning is very important to a lot of communities around the country. Again, not just here in Ohio. More and more communities are looking at doing it. And the reason you put it in the charter is because if you look to the mayor or the administration, the mayor today has the power and authority to require the finance director to say, look, we're going to do a five-year plan. I want it done. And it would happen. But that hasn't happened in all the history of the city. Because two things. One, it's not mandated by we the people that there be a five-year plan. If there were a five-year plan, that would be our instruction as voters to our mayor, to our finance director, say, look, we want this. We want you to invest time and effort and money in projecting where the city's going to be at for planning purposes. And you do it in law because we want it to be done. Why do we have seven council meetings? That's how many we chose. So, you know, it's not a policy. It's not part of a job description. A lot of charters have that kind of information in there. You can make it one line. You don't have to make it as detailed as I did. Make it one line that the mayor and finance director shall provide a five-year forecast, period. And then you can leave it up to them how detailed they want to make it. I just chose to put it in there because it's a logical sequence. If you're going to do a five-year capital plan, to do a five-year budget forecast to make sure you're going to have funding available. It's also very beneficial to taxpayers when you look at things like levies. Do we really need it? Don't we really need it? Is somebody panicking? You can look at things in a forecasting financial means. How many of us look forward to retirement? Do we plan our retirements on what's going to take place next year? No. We look at it 30 years from now, maybe, 20 years from now, 15 years from now. So it isn't something that's just year to year. Just so you know, the current law of Ohio is one year, but in schools it's five, and they did it through law. They have to do it through the charter. It's the only way I know to do it, to have it enforceable. And the reason why five year for the schools is because they have levies that typically run five years. That's the reason for that. And that's why they say for city requirement by law, Ohio Vice Code, one year. So you know, now, Lauren, and mm -hmm. in two parts I hear Jenny over here is saying that you know a, a five-year plan for a city, y you can almost throw it out because I think her main thing was that things change over that period of time. 
And as a financial planner myself, I understand what you're talking about when you're talking about planning for retirement and everything. But we're usually talking about growing assets and, right. and, and investing. Right. And cities are more or less talking about managing spending with revenue that's coming in. And, and it, it, it is somewhat, I would think, a year-to-year -year basis. For instance, if we, we had a five-year projection, mm -hmm. and, and you wouldn't be holding anybody's thumbs to the screws on a five-year projection, but there's no way that you can can account for Chrysler closing down. Right. You know, so you're in your second year of your projection, but yeah, now you're projecting out another five years, but then boom, we've got this. Mm -hmm. And, and I've, I've got to give the city credit where we went through that. We weathered a storm quite well. And I mean, that is, you know, government as well as the people pulling together and voting for a, a raising income taxes and then five years later the city following through with their promise that they'd put it back on the ballot and right. and I know next year I don't have to pay any taxes to twin additional no taxes are going to have in jail my friend <laughs> no I pay no the, I don't know if you guys realize this I, I mean I aside from real estate taxes next year I will pay zero in because they have in income taxes because yeah, of the reciprocity. reciprocity yeah. right. First time I did my taxes, I called up the director of finance because I thought I did them wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> to like, how do you counter what I think Jenny made a good point there was that? Yeah. Well, when you use the word forecast, Jenny is correct because when you do any budget, as Karen will vouch, when you do a budget the first of the year, how many times during the year do you amend that budget? because the same thing holds true with a five-year forecast. It's not set in stone. I said forecast. I didn't say five-year guarantee. But what it does is it will allow, and it basically mandates that the administration of your city put together the thought process of a five-year plan. So that when you're doing negotiations with eight different bargaining units, a 3% increase plus the cost of benefits in one year might be X. But over a five-year period with compounding it might be why mm. and so when you start and do those things in government what it does is it does two things it gives you discipline in finance and it also gives you the ability to do better planning for hiring or what your uh, manpower requirements are for the city just like schools it's a very large portion of it is personnel and personnel cost and benefits uh, probably in the city, I'm guessing we're probably somewhere around 60 to 70 percent for our wages and benefits for our employees. So <coughs> staffing is very important. When you hire a police officer, you anticipate doing it. You should be able at least to look down the road and say, am I going to have a sustainable income so that I can hire these people? So it, it's a discipline and a forecasting method that if you're financial forecasting, or else you'll agree, you have to have discipline to do that. And quite often, looking at just the current year, and saying, why don't we look at it down the road? Where will we project ourselves to be in five years? Which it will can and change every year. It depends on what happens. You know, like you said, if you have some major, major financial impact, you want to then go back and rethink that five-year plan. Let me also add to that. Discipline, discipline is daily. You, your revenues can change from one month to the other, and you do. You make amendments. You update your certificate of estimated resources to reflect any new monies, any monies that you predicted was going to come, it's not going to come. That's the due diligence of a finance director anyway. You have to do that on a daily basis. You look at your revenue source. You ask questions. Why aren't we getting this money in this time? We projected it this way. How come it's not coming? So it's not about, um, you know, we're just sitting idle just to see what's going to happen because that's, that's not my process. We're very proactive. We communicate. I communicate. The mayor communicates to all the department heads. We do hold our purse strings tight. We try to <coughs> make sure that we engage council, and we don't have to make the effort because council is an engaging council. They're proactive, and they ask the questions. We have finance committee meetings. Before, that's why the layer of planning a budget t is so extensive, because they are involved. So, you know, yeah, I could project five years, and what is it going to mean for me? I can do that on my own, but to implement it into a charter, I don't think so. I just think personally, if I want to do a 10-year forecast, I should be able to do that. If I want to do a five-year in my policy and procedure, I should want to be able to do that. 
But to put it in there and say, so we can make sure that we're doing it, I'm very disciplined. I can't speak for other finance directors that come in before and after me, but I can tell you how I perform. And there's, everyone has an entitled, entitled to their opinions, but that's just mine. And so obviously it has paid off because prior to the city in 2008 when I was here, even before that, the previous finance director was proactive in communicating. But in 2008 we saw something happening, the trends of our revenue were changing, and we started addressing it before Chrysler even told us that something was going to change. So we already had in the plan of what we should do. So it's not like we're sitting just waiting for something to happen. This is a policy in my perspective, and I think that it belongs there. It doesn't belong in the charter. Okay. I have a question. Um, obviously, there's expenses that you, you, you can manage quite easily, and there's other expenses that, in a way, you do have to project. And this is more or less just, the, for my knowledge, when you, you look at the, the unionized pensions that are out there, police and fire, I would imagine that you are doing projections you you have an idea of who we is have, going to well, retire what happens is we get communication from some economy because we only get a certain percentage of property tax that takes care of that like this year hundred and seventy thousand dollars the rest of it has to be funded subsidized by the general fund uh, so planning that out and looking at the trends now that we have a three-year contract in place from the previous year we know about estimating what we have to fund in that police pension so there is a process for that the subsidy is like this year, it's over $1 million. It's the first time in many years that that had to happen. But as you increase your, your um, pay rates to certain uh, employees, that too increases and it affects it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate you inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak. And thank you, Lauren. Where are we? Law director. law director position should have more ties to city council and a performance review should be implemented. I just have a question on the performance reviews. Um, Mayor, I get, you know, when you look at the employees of the city, is that something that most cities do? Is, I mean, in business, you know, you know, obviously we do performance reviews all the time, but is that something that's done here also? Oh, we yeah. do performance reviews, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, Generally, mine with the department heads, I just keep in daily contact with them. They, they have a clear understanding, I believe, on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. on their job performance. <coughs> uh, we have formalized performance review within the department. Right. I would think by law you're going to have formalized performance reviews in case you have to terminate someone. Absolutely. Does, does the law director have a performance review? I don't give them a written uh, performance review, but as I said, we're, we're communicating daily, <laughs> all the department heads. And I don't hold back with how I feel about job performance, believe me. We have well, I mean, and, and you do appoint the law director. And if, and if there is a problem, those things do go into their file. I mean, if, if there is a problem, I, I do put something in their file. Okay. Does anybody else have any? Yes, if counsel objects to the way the law director does something, <coughs> can they make out something to be placed in the law director's file? Not in the file. That would be my duty to do that. Okay. But they can certainly address it with me and or the law director. Okay. Absolutely. So it doesn't go in his permanent file? Well, only right. if the mayor. If I put in, right. in his permanent That's file. just like probably most of us in the business world. You wouldn't want a manager from another department to be able to put something in your personnel file. Right. If you had a disagreement, that would be pretty bad. It has to be your immediate manager. <laughs> And penalties for non-performance of elected officials should be implemented. Um, I, I kind of touched on that one, so you know my opinion on that earlier. And more or less, it was a penalty of, of government or th an official who had made something up. And my argument was that what courts are for. But does anybody have penalties for non-performance of elected officials? The, I guess some would get fired and some could be recalled. I, I'm just voting. Who decides yeah, that? Definitely won't be reelected. Right. Um, right? Well, you're right. So is that all there is on that point right there? 
Uh, do I'll do you have the handout that Lauren <laughs> gave out a couple weeks ago? I do. Okay. I have it right Jack next to that's it. in reference to page two. I mean, we can run over this, I guess, very quickly. The, the, and I believe this is what it's addressing. This is the forfeiture of office. Yeah. Lauren, is that? Yeah. Um, there are a lot of communities around the country. I don't just look at Ohio when I look about government because I've worked in other states too. But there, if you look from a standpoint, of course. I don't want to put Gary on the spot, but when you're sitting up as a council person, as an elected representative, um, you know, you make decisions, a lot of decisions. And some of those decisions I look at, and it, it'd be different if there were, just like we do in our jobs, at least when I did my jobs, and I had performance valuations. If I didn't do well, A, I didn't get raises, or B, I could get fired. Uh, elected positions in this country, uh, all too often for the last hundreds of years, have always counted on quota recall or, well, they won't get reelected sometime, but you, know, you look throughout our country at some of the people that have been elected and you have to giggle at, you know, what the hell were the people thinking? Um, but quite honestly, I think if you put some requirements that these decisions they make are, are damn serious and um, spending taxpayers' money on various lawsuits and things of this nature. And I think that there should be additional accountability of our elected folks in the form of, hey, um, you know, if we go and say we're not going to do X, Y, and Z, but that's a power maybe that we gave the people in the charter, the right to vote on, and we say no, we're going to go along with a law director or somebody else's opinion and say no, we're not going to, we don't think the people should have the right to vote on that. And they go to court and they win the right to vote based upon a judge and or jury or however they do it, again, I'm no attorney, but they find out that, yes, the people do have the right to vote on that. I don't know how you feel, but I think the Charter is all about that. It's about our rights and how we want to be governed. And from my perspective, there's all kinds of disciplinary measures on everybody that works for our city except for our elected people. The only thing they risk is a recall, which, again, is extremely cumbersome. The forfeiture of office, I think, is something that if you look at, just like the, in quote, other communities you call whatever you want. You could call it an impeachment hearing. We don't have any rules for impeachment. If we think somebody's not doing their job or they've done something wrong, what happens today is uh, if one of our council people commits and is found guilty of a felony, what happens to them? Do they have to be recalled or do they automatically lose their position? Our charter is silent. Yeah, but don't they take an oath of office? That it, absolutely. And under Section 904, there's removal for malfeasance, misfeasance, for neglect of duty. But it's through recall, isn't it? No. How do they do it? M members of the council can remove Council one of may own. expel yeah. or remove any of its own members. No. If they feel that's sufficient, then so be it. Well, let's take a, we'll do a comparison. Yeah. I think I we will take a closer look and, and, and compare, you know, your piece on forfeiture of office. Um, wording regarding appointments, qualifications on various boards and commissions, sections needs to be reviewed. Mrs. Spira will review and bring to a future meeting. So do that. And Mr. Metropolis suggested ward designations for city services on boards and commissions be removed. We did address that earlier. So we have gone through this. And Jenny, once again, thank you. This was thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. I think we've had our audience comments section. Is there any miscellaneous things that need to be brought up at this point in time? There being none, I believe we did set the date for the next meeting, March 31st at 7 p.m. Excuse me. I did have other than, I know I've been talking a lot. This, that's because I go right ahead. gave you a lot. I'd like just a couple of minutes on some things uh, since I've been to all the meetings. Um, after the last CRC uh, meeting, uh, and the, there was a release of a new document to you all by the law director, um, I started looking into the records 
regarding section 10.01 of the charter. And what I found was is that uh, if you look at there were two ordinances done and it was rather confusing and a little bit difficult to follow but back in 2009 when the Charter Review Commission uh, passed the resolution one or they didn't the council passed the resolution 120-2009 the verbiage and the wording of that resolution was considerably different from that of resolution 120-2012 um, and this is going back, I wasn't here, well, I was here at the time, but I wasn't active in the community. But I, I think the, the, the commission ought to look at the, the wording and whereas sections of resolution 120-2012 because <clears throat> there's indications in that resolution that everything that was basically done in 2009 was changed in the 2012 uh, resolution that the folks voted on. Uh, in 2009, uh, the charter in section 1001 used the word shall. So it was implied that whatever this commission came up with in the charter amendments shall basically go to the ballot unless I think five of the seven voter uh, members of council. But when I look at resolution 120, 2012, because he didn't publish it or something back in 2009, the wording and stuff of that resolution is different. It uses words like may, which that one word is a big difference in a charter. Mm -hmm. Obviously shall is mandatory and is required where may is an elective. So I, I think you really need to, to maybe look into that or have someone look into Well, was, was, was your concern, Lauren, that if the Charter Review Commission gives something to council that it wouldn't be placed on a ballot, that they have the ability to say. Yeah, in essence, that. See, now, the way I read this, because this, did, and I think this, this is correct in here, and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you. The council may, by affirmative vote of five or more members of its, uh, of its members, submit to the electors any proposed amendment or amendments to this charter, mm -hmm. semicolon or any amendments recommended by a duly appointed Charter Review Commission shall be submitted to the electors unless five or more members of council vote against. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I see what you're saying there. But, but it is quite different. Um, <clears throat> again, um, I'm just a resident out here, but it's obvious being at the meetings that the law director has been at one of the last five meetings, this is the fifth meeting the commission has had, you guys have all been here, I know. Um, you know, the Charter Review Commission does have uh, the ability to have an independent legal counsel look at all of this, and no disrespect for Mr. May Strauss, he's the law director, but having a second set of eyes look at these things sometimes might find different issues, might give you some different insights into things. Um, I would also like to have the CRC look at maybe one more thing, and that is, is under Article 11 of the Charter Review Commission, where it actually talks about the commission. Right now, you're appointed by uh, council and by legislation of council. There are means, and I would think you might want to just talk about it. You don't have to look at me like I'm the only person saying this. You might want to consider having the Charter Review Commission, uh, rather than being appointed by council, having it or appointed by a mayor have it actually be elected positions for a term of office until the next Charter Review Commission is uh, a duly elected type of thing rather than being appointed. And, and I put that out there only because the Charter Commission really requires an awful lot of uh, either A, institutional knowledge of government and their operations in the Charter and in the city, or an awful lot of education and background research to, in my opinion, be effective in it. I mean, I got a lot of years in government. It's difficult for me sometimes to keep up with all the areas that you're talking about. So it's just a thought I came up with. Just kick it around if you want. But I think you might want to consider having those elected positions because one, uh, if a person has to take out a petition, get 25 to 50 signatures on it, it would really indicate a strong desire they want to <laughs> basically serve on it. And, and I would, I mean, given a choice, if I could run for an office versus being appointed uh, through a political process is what you're actually looking at. So there's another thought I came up with. Um, I do think that 
in uh, looking at uh, the clarity of 7A01, I just urge everybody here to be very cautious on that because 7A01 is obviously the rights of the citizens to vote on what our community's future is. And that's where an issue where you folks have been talking about wards comes into strong play because a uh, zoning amendment or change to zoning classification requires a passage in all five wards. So you want to look at that very cautiously. It's a very, very strong and benefit, a benefit of our charter that a lot of communities don't have. And it does give you additional legal standing, in my opinion, in the courts if the people vote not to rezone a parcel of property versus a planning commission and just council. So I'd look at it very closely and how you clarify that. Be very cautious because it's a strong right in this community has and it's a lot different than a lot of other communities don't have and they, they pay a price for not having that control at the voter level. So that's just, I just wanted to point that out. Quick question for yeah. you. Section 10.01. Yes, go ahead. Early on, you, you referenced now, I, I see the, the amendment that was on the ballot, 120 2012. Right. You said, though, look at the one in 2009. Did you have a ballot number there? I thought well, I. I don't know what the issues were. I have the resolutions. The resolutions that were used with the language to put it on the ballot in 2009 is not, quote, as it says in the 2012 version, identical because it was changed in the resolution in 2012 versus what it was in 2009. And it, it was approved in both instances, but the way resolution 120-2012 reads, it talks about, this is basically the same thing we did in 2009 and it is not the same wording. So it's 120-2012, what was, did you have the, the... And the one from 2009 is resolution 120 2009. Right, they okay. are different. If you compare those two, and they're both online, that's where I got it from the website. And correct me if I'm mistaken, but 120 2009 passed, yep. but it's one of those that was not official because of the notification process, the publication process that was needed in the paper, correct? So it well, had to be there, placed there on the public, ballot again? There was, a, there was a publication issue, as I understand it, in the 2009 ballot, but under the what I understand about the laws what I've read in the Constitution here in Ohio is upheld that when the voters vote on an issue whether it was published or not once the voters have actually voted on it it is law and it is a charter amendment that way that's the way I've read it and if you look at what we did there it implies in 2012 that it is exactly what took place identical is the word they use the 2009 and it is not it okay. was different so if you take a close look at it, you'll see what I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have. So I'd say at that next meeting, be prepared to start at Section 3 and dive in, and let's make a decision on, I'd say, the, the next meeting we are going to decide which ones we really want to start seeking ballot language for and if, if we do want to pursue this. So let's be prepared to start on that, and we'll work through until you know the hours get we <laughs> <laughs> sound good yes all right uh, that's all I have folks does anybody have anything else to bring forth before we consider closing I'd make a motion that we close this meeting of the Charter Review Commission I'll second it. Seconded by Dean. I shall call the roll. Twyla Jones? Yes. Dave Albright? Yes. Russ Sipen, yes. Dean Martin? Yes. Drew Romito? Yes. Jenny Spira? Yes. Jay Magnus? Yes. And Kimberly Monachino? Yes. All right, we are closed. See you all on the 31st.